Hello viewers, I am Dr. Rovio. I work as a lecturer in pathology in a medical college hospital and I am making this video for my students and also for you. Hope someone finds this helpful. Today's topic is on edema. This video will contain the definition of edema followed by the pathophysiological categories of edema. We will also talk about the concept of transudate and exudate and the morphology of edema and we will finish our discussion today by discussing briefly renal edema, cardiac edema and pulmonary edema. Okay, so a lot of topics, so let's begin. First question, what do we mean by edema? Now the word edema was derived from a Greek word that means swelling. So how can we define edema? So as written in your textbook, edema can be defined as an abnormal and excessive accumulation of free fluid in the interstitial tissue spaces and serous cavities. Okay, I hope you're still with me. You didn't run away just like my students do when I try to teach them definitions of pathology. I even have to show them teddy bears to keep them calm. So look, I am also showing you a teddy bear to keep you calm. So don't run away. Don't be scared because I will explain this definition line by line now. So, what did we see in the first line of the definition? Edema can be defined as abnormal and excessive accumulation of free fluid. Now, notice the term abnormal. So, this is an abnormal condition. And what is happening here? There is accumulation of free fluid. And also notice the term excessive accumulation. The thing is, free fluid is present in interstitial tissue space and also small amount of free fluid is also present in the serous cavity. Very small amount. But that is not edema. So edema will result when the amount of free fluid in the interstitial tissue spaces and in the serous cavities or the body cavity that has increased in an excessive manner, okay? So, edema can be defined as an abnormal and excessive accumulation of free fluid and where is this accumulation happening? It is happening in the interstitial tissue spaces and in the serous cavities. Now, you may ask me, Dr. Rubio, what do we mean by interstitial tissue spaces? Now, always remember this is the space that lies in between the cells. Okay, so interstitial space is the space between, in between the cells. And don't confuse this. So this is intercellular. Okay, so don't confuse this thing with intracellular. And in some textbooks you may also see a term uh, that is intracellular edema. However, there is also a better term uh, to say that, and that is hydropic degeneration. So always remember that thing. Now always remember, whenever edema is occurring in serous cavities or body cavities, that is also called effusion. For example, whenever there is abnormal and excessive accumulation of fluid in the pleural cavity, that is known as pleural effusion or hydrothorax. Similarly, whenever there is uh, edema in the pericardial cavity, that is known as pericardial effusion or hydropericardium. And whenever there is abnormal and excessive accumulation of fluid in the peritoneal cavity, that is known as ascites. So now that we have defined edema and explained explained the definition. Now we will move on and uh, talk about the pathophysiologic categories of edema. So as you can see, in the whiteboard I have written all the causes of edema and according to pathophysiology, edema can be classified 
mainly into five major groups. So they are edema due to increased hydrostatic pressure and if I want to be more specific, increased capillary hydrostatic pressure. Another cause of edema is decreased plasma osmotic pressure, lymphatic obstruction, sodium retention and inflammation. So all these things can cause edema and we will talk about these things now one by one. So in the pathophysiologic categories of edema, the first group was edema due to increased capillary hydrostatic pressure. Now what do we mean by that? So in order to explain that thing you can see that I have drawn a very simplified image in the board. So this is a very simple diagrammatic representation of a capillary bed. Now always remember in the capillary bed normally we have numerous capillaries but we have simplified that thing here and we have just drawn one capillary to explain this thing in a much more easier way. So in the capillary bed we have capillaries this is one of those capillaries and uh, they have arterial end through which arterial blood is coming to the capillary of the capillary bed and they also have a venous end through which blood is leaving the capillary bed right and two pressure has important role in fluid exchange between the blood vessel and interstitial space and one of them is capillary hydrostatic pressure and the other important pressure is plasma osmotic pressure. So we will talk about these two things first. So what do we mean by capillary hydrostatic pressure? It is the pressure exerted by the fluid inside the capillary and the pressure is exerted where? The pressure is exerted towards the wall of the capillary. And as a matter of fact, the capillary hydrostatic pressure tends to drive fluid out of the blood vessel into the interstitial space. So whenever there is increased capillary hydrostatic pressure, that can cause edema. But also remember, under normal condition, this hydrostatic pressure is balanced by an opposite pressure, and that is the plasma osmotic pressure. And plasma osmotic pressure is usually exerted by the plasma proteins, mainly by the albumin that are present inside the blood vessel, and they tend to draw water from outside of the blood vessel or from the interstitial space towards the blood vessel, towards the inside of the blood vessel. So as you can see with the direction of the arrows, we can see that um, two opposing pressures are acting uh, in the capillary bed. One is the capillary hydrostatic pressure that wants to drive fluid out of the blood vessel inside the interstitial space. And similarly, there is also another pressure that is exerted by the plasma proteins mainly and that is called the osmotic pressure, the plasma osmotic pressure. And that pressure wants to draw fluid inside the blood vessel and they are in a balance and that's why under normal condition only small amount of fluid is liberated in the interstitial space. So always remember that uh, the hydrostatic pressure is higher in the arterial end and it is lower in the venous end. And like I said, due to the balance between the two opposing forces, only small amount of fluid is present outside the blood vessel in the interstitial space. And that fluid is again, that thing goes in the lymphatics that are present in those interstitial spaces. And so the lymphatics, it goes ultimately towards the thoracic duct and so that fluid is also drained and that's why our tissues under normal condition, they don't have edema in the interstitial space. But what happens when the 
hydrostatic pressure of the capillary is increased. More fluid will now draw out of the blood vessel and that will result in an overload of fluid in the interstitial space. And if the lymphatics are no longer able to cope with the excess amount of fluid that is coming in the interstitial space, what will happen? Edema will result. And that is the mechanism of edema in increased hydrostatic pressure of the capillary. Now, it can happen due to various causes. One of them is due to impaired venous return. Now, what are the causes of impaired venous return? So, the causes of impaired venous return will include congestive cardiac failure, constrictive pericarditis, ascites, and venous compression or obstruction. Now, we will talk in details about the mechanism of edema in congestive cardiac failure when we discuss cardiac edema. So the next cause that I mentioned was constrictive pericarditis, what's happening here. Here the pericardium, the outermost covering of the heart, that pericardium becomes thickened and there is also fibrosis occurring in the pericardium. And these things make the pericardium non-compliant. As a result, the heart cannot function properly and that results in impaired venous return. So moving on to the next cause of impaired venous return and that was ascites and uh, that can also happen due to liver cirrhosis. The causes of venous compression or obstruction will include thrombosis, pressure from outside due to some external mass or tumor and another cause of obstruction of the vein or compression of the vein is due to lower extremity inactivity with prolonged dependency. So these were in short the causes of impaired venous return and regarding thrombosis I have also a video entirely on thrombosis and you can also look into that for more information. Now notice that Arteriolar dilation can also result in increased hydrostatic pressure. So what are the causes of arteriolar dilation? Heat can cause that and also another cause of arteriolar dilation is due to neurohumoral dysregulation. So these were the causes of increased capillary hydrostatic pressure and as I have mentioned, whenever there is increased capillary hydrostatic pressure, that can result in edema. So now we will move on to the next pathophysiologic category of edema, and that was edema due to reduced plasma osmotic pressure. Now, reduced plasma osmotic pressure will happen by two mechanisms. The first mechanism is by decreased production of plasma proteins. Now always remember that plasma proteins are responsible for creating the osmotic pressure inside the um, plasma that tends to draw fluid from outside of the blood vessel toward the blood vessel. And whenever there is reduced production of plasma protein, that will therefore hamper the balance between the osmotic pressure and the capillary hydrostatic pressure and result in edema. So what are the causes uh, of reduced synthesis of plasma protein? The first cause is severe liver disease, for example during end-stage liver cirrhosis. The reason is liver was the major organ responsible for producing plasma proteins. So it is obvious if we have some severe disease in the liver that will hamper the protein synthesis. Other causes of reduced protein synthesis will include protein malnutrition. The second mechanism uh, by which we can have reduced plasma osmotic pressure is if there is increased loss of plasma protein. And causes will include nephrotic syndrome and protein losing gastroenteropathy. Now regarding nephrotic syndrome, always remember that in nephrotic syndrome, which is a type of glomerular disease, massive amount of protein will be lost with the urine, so there will be massive proteinuria, and as a result of that loss, edema will develop. 
always remember that uh, in this type of uh, edema, I mean the edema that is happening due to hypoproteinemia, this type of edema is often generalized and generalized edema is also known as anasarca. So how much protein has to be um, lost in order to develop edema? In your textbook you will see that whenever the level of plasma protein becomes less than 5 gram per deciliter or whenever the plasma albumin level becomes less than 2.5 gram per deciliter um, that will often result in edema formation. So now we'll talk about the next category and that was edema due to lymphatic obstruction. Now we have already talked about the role of lymphatics when we discussed this diagrammatic image. Recall that the interstitial fluid or the fluid that comes from the blood vessel to the interstitial space, that interstitial fluid is cleared by lymphatics. So it is obvious if there is some obstruction in the lymphatics, there will be increased accumulation of fluid in the interstitial space and that will result in edema. And this type of edema is known as lymphedema. So what are the causes of such lymphedema? It can happen following surgery, following radiation treatment. It can also happen due to tumors and inflammation. So let's give some examples. First, we will talk about surgery. Suppose a patient was diagnosed with breast carcinoma, then that patient undergone radical mastectomy and axillary lymph nodes of the affected side were also removed. So what will happen to this patient? There is high chance that this patient can develop lymphedema in the superior extremity of the affected side due to the loss of axillary lymph node and also due to damage in the lymphatics of the affected side. Another cause of lymphatic obstruction is inflammation. For example, in the disease filariasis, which is caused by the microorganism Ucheraria bancrofti, there is fibrosis in the lymphatics and lymph nodes of the external genitalia and lower extremities. And that fibrosis results in obstruction of the lymph channel. Sometimes the obstruction is so severe that there is massive edema of the lower extremity and the external genitalia. And that is known as elephantiasis. Lymphatic obstruction can also seen in malignancy when the malignant cells are obstructing the lymph channels. Again, lymphatic obstruction can be also caused by compression from outside, particularly on thoracic duct. Say for example, if there is a tumor or some effusion in some serosal cavity and that mass compress thoracic duct that will cause obstruction of the lymph flow and result in um, edema. And sometimes the thoracic duct may even rupture and that will release the content or the lymph into various body cavities. If lymph is released in the pleural cavity, that is known as chylothorax, and if lymph is liberated in the peritoneal cavity, that is known as chylus ascites. Now, one thing you have to remember, lymphedema can also happen due to hereditary causes. There is a disease called Milroy's disease, which is also known as hereditary lymphedema. And in this disease, there is developmental abnormalities of the lymphatic channels. And this disease is familial in nature, and uh, it usually causes lymphedema in the lower extremity, either in one or both lower extremity. So also keep that thing in your mind that lymphedema can be also due to some hereditary causes and the disease is called Milroy's disease which causes edema in either one or both lower limbs and that is familial in nature. Now the next pathophysiologic category of edema was edema due to salt and water retention or edema due to sodium and water retention. Now always remember, whenever there is retention of sodium, 
that retention of salt will be associated with retention of water as well. And retention of salt and water can cause edema by two mechanisms. Because whenever there is retention of salt and water, the first thing is there is increase in the volume, in the intravascular volume. In your textbook you will see a term that is intravascular fluid volume expansion. And that thing will increase the capillary hydrostatic pressure. At the same time, whenever there is retention of salt and water, that will also reduce the colloidal osmotic pressure by diluting the plasma. So, in one hand, there will be increased capillary hydrostatic pressure, and at the same time, there will be also reduced colloidal osmotic pressure. And from our previous discussion, we have seen that both of these conditions will promote edema. And we will talk in details about the mechanism of salt and water retention and how that thing causes edema when we talk about the mechanism of renal and cardiac edema. So the last category, the last pathophysiologic category of edema was edema due to inflammation. Now I have four videos entirely on inflammation and you can also watch those videos after finishing this video for more information. And for this video, just remember that during inflammation, there is increased vascular permeability and that is the major mechanism by which edema occurs during inflammation. So always remember that during inflammation, there is increased vascular permeability and that can cause edema. And edema in inflammation is always exudative in nature. So now that we have talked about the pathophysiologic categories of edema, now we will move on and talk about the concept of transudate and exudate. So here is a chart showing the major differences between transudate and exudate. Now what do we mean by transudate and exudate? Now always remember transudate is the non-inflammatory edema fluid. It can be defined as filtrate of blood plasma that is produced without any change of the vascular permeability. So that is the definition of transudate. Filtrate of blood plasma that is produced without altering or changing the vascular permeability. On the contrary, exudate is inflammatory fluid and that is produced when there is alteration in the vascular permeability and that thing happens during inflammation. So what are the major differences between the transudate and exudate? So the first thing is obvious, the transudate is non-inflammatory edema fluid and exudate is inflammatory in nature. The protein content of the transudate will be low, as you can see it will be less than 1 gram per deciliter and also fibrinogen level will be lower here. On the contrary, protein content will be higher in exudate and so will be the fibrinogen level and that's why exudate will have an increased tendency to coagulate. The next point is regarding the specific gravity. Obviously, the specific gravity of transudate will be low, less than 1.015 and the specific gravity of exudate is higher, that is more than 1.018. And also remember, the transudate will have very few cells and they will mainly contain mesothelial cells and also some cell debris. On the other hand, exudate will be rich in cell. It will have many cell types and they will include both inflammatory cells as well as parenchymal cells. So this was in short about the basic concept of transudate and exudate and also their differences. Regarding the morphology of edema, always remember that edema under the microscope can be identified by watching the clearing 
and separation of extracellular matrix and also there will be subtle cellular swelling and uh, edema can happen in any tissue but it commonly happens in subcutaneous tissue lungs and in the brain so now we will talk about the mechanism of cardiac edema and we will explain how edema is formed in congestive cardiac failure and to explain that you can see that I have drawn a flowchart in the whiteboard so it's a very big flowchart but don't get scared because I will try to explain this step by step so first we can see congestive cardiac failure now what will happen when our heart is suffering from congestive cardiac failure heart cannot pump properly right so there will be reduced cardiac output reduced cardiac output will result in hypovolemia so the effective circulating blood volume will be reduced so what will be the outcome now hypovolemia will have a lot of outcome so first let's see what will happen in the kidney so whenever there is reduced blood volume or hypovolemia that thing will be sensed by the baroreceptor now can you recall the locations of the baroreceptor yes they are located in the aortic arch and also in the carotid sinus so once those baroreceptors are detecting that there is reduced blood volume they will do what they will send sympathetic outflow via the vasomotor center and like the name implies whenever the sympathetic outflow is sent by the vasomotor center there will be vasospasm so particularly in the kidney there will be vasospasm of the renal arteries and that will also result in renal ischemia there will be less blood flowing in the kidney so whenever there is renal ischemia that is less blood flowing into the kidney obviously the filtration rate of the glomerulus will also reduce so as you can see renal ischemia that will result in reduced glomerular filtration rate or reduced GFR so whenever we are reducing the glomerular filtration rate so less sodium will be excreted so ultimately there will be retention of sodium so this is one mechanism that will lead to edema and this was the renal mechanism but also you can see that hypovolemia will also have some other uh, mechanisms involved which will also result in edema for example whenever there is hypovolemia there will be renal ischemia and that will also uh, lead to reduced amount of sodium in the renal tubules now always remember whenever there is reduced amount of sodium in the renal tubules the juxtra glomerular apparatus particularly the granular cells of the juxtra glomerular apparatus will release renin and renin will act on angiotensinogen and that thing will stimulate angiotensinogen and that will result in production of angiotensin 1 in the plasma angiotensin 1 after it's produced in the plasma will go to the lungs and kidney and there with the help of the enzyme angiotensin converting enzyme angiotensin 1 will be converted into angiotensin 2 and angiotensin 2 will act in the adrenal cortex and it will help in release of aldosterone and always remember aldosterone is a very powerful salt retention hormone so aldosterone will result in salt retention and that will also result in edema at the same time look what's happening here whenever there is hypovolemia that will also stimulate antidiuretic hormone from the posterior pituitary and that thing will increase water retention and that thing will also result in edema 
So this is the mechanism of edema that is happening in congestive cardiac failure as a result of reduced cardiac output. But note at the flowchart that there are some other mechanism um, that can also cause edema whenever there is heart failure. For example, whenever there is congestive cardiac failure, the central venous pressure will increase. And as a result, the capillary hydrostatic pressure will also increase afterwards. And this is known as the back pressure hypothesis. So first, the pressure is increasing in the uh, vein, the central venous pressure is increasing, and uh, later that is causing increase in the capillary hydrostatic pressure, and we have discussed that increased capillary hydrostatic pressure is a very important cause of edema. So that will also lead to edema, and this mechanism is known as the back pressure hypothesis. Similarly, in some textbook, you will also see another hypothesis that is the opposite and that's the forward pressure hypothesis. And in this hypothesis, whenever there is congestive cardiac failure, there will be also chronic hypoxia. And that will lead to increased capillary permeability and that will also result in edema. So these were the mechanisms uh, of edema in congestive cardiac failure. Regarding the mechanism of edema that we see in certain renal disease, for example in nephrotic syndrome, always remember that in nephrotic syndrome there is massive loss of protein, particularly massive loss of albumin, and there is massive proteinuria. And we have seen that albumin played a very important role um, by exerting the plasma colloidal osmotic pressure. So whenever there is loss of albumin, say for example in a kidney disease like nephrotic syndrome, the plasma colloidal osmotic pressure will reduce. And we have discussed earlier that whenever there is reduced plasma osmotic pressure, that can also lead to edema. So that was the mechanism of edema that we see uh, in nephrotic syndrome. So that was in short about the renal edema. So now we will talk about the pulmonary edema. Now pulmonary edema has a very interesting feature that makes it unique from the other varieties of edema. And that is whenever there is severe pulmonary edema, excess fluid will not only accumulate in the interstitial tissue space but also inside the alveoli. So what are the major mechanisms of pulmonary edema? There are usually two major mechanisms. The first one is by increased pulmonary capillary hydrostatic pressure and the second mechanism is by increasing the vascular permeability. So let's talk about these things one by one. So what are the causes of increased capillary hydrostatic pressure in the lungs. So what are the causes of increased pulmonary capillary hydrostatic pressure? They will include left heart failure, mitral stenosis, pulmonary vein obstruction, thyrotoxicosis, cardiac surgery, and uh, any obstruction of the lymphatic outflow and usually these are caused by certain tumors and inflammation. So all these things will raise first the pulmonary venous pressure and that will result in increased pulmonary capillary hydrostatic pressure. And as we have said before, whenever there is elevated hydrostatic pressure in the capillary, fluid will go out of the blood vessel and they will go into the interstitial tissue spaces of the lung and result in interstitial edema. This is followed by thickening of the alveolar walls. But also remember, up to this point, there is no interference with the gaseous exchange that is happening in the lung alveoli. However, if this condition persists for a prolonged period of time, more and more fluid will begin to accumulate in the interstitial tissue spaces of the lungs and the lymphatic system that are seen in the interstitial space of the lungs will be unable to cope with the 
excessive amount of fluid accumulating in the interstitial tissue space. So there will be very high pressure in the interstitial tissue space and ultimately that will result in rupture of the alveoli and fluid will then enter the alveoli and that will result in alveolar edema. So this was the first mechanism. The second mechanism of pulmonary edema is by increasing the vascular permeability. Now the causes will include various types of infection in the lungs. It can also happen due to some toxic substance as a result of some adverse drug reaction, hypersensitivity, shock. All these things can result in increased vascular permeability. And the mechanism is all these things will damage the uh, lining endotheliums of the blood vessel and that will increase the vascular permeability. Now the last thing that we will talk about is regarding brain edema. Now brain edema can be localized or generalized and it depends on the type of injury and also on the nature of the pathology, on the nature of the underlying pathology. And whenever there is brain edema, the sulci become narrowed and the gyri become distended and they become distended against an unyielding skull. Now, is that a good thing? No, that's a very dangerous thing. And that is the reason why brain edema can be very dangerous and even fatal because the distended or soul and brain is now getting compressed against the unyielding skull. So always remember that brain edema is very dangerous and it can be often fatal. So this concludes today's video on edema. I hope this video was helpful. If you like my videos, do comment, share, subscribe and let me know. And for my students, I will also recommend you to go through your textbooks to know more information. Okay, so that's all for today. Until next time, take care and stay blessed. Thank you.